The illegal settler war on Palestinians, with most eyes focused on the destruction of Gaza, increasingly violent settler activity in the occupied West Bank goes almost unnoticed. Illegal under international law, but proceeding nonetheless, as the war on Gaza provided Israeli settlers with cover to attack. I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is the Occupied West Bank's settlers. Israeli settlers have long insisted that taking Palestinian land is their biblical birthright. But every ruling in international law has disagreed. Still, with Israeli government support, settlers have not only continued to build illegal homes, they've become increasingly violent toward the Palestinians that they want displaced. Even before October 7th, settlers had attacked Palestinian villages. In one instance, they set fire to more than 30 homes and over 100 cars in Nablus. And since Israel's war on Gaza began, the UN reports an average of seven settler attacks per day on Palestinians, often with the support of Israeli forces. Here's a look now at the increasingly untenable situation of settlers in the occupied West Bank. The United Nations says the latest Israeli settler raids and firearm attacks on Palestinians are unlike any other. The previous average of three incidents per day is now seven. 171 hostilities against landowners have been reported, 26 of which are classified as casualty incidents. Overall, 115 Palestinian properties are said to be damaged. Firearm intimidation tactics are now common in settler-related incidents as well. At least nine Palestinians have been killed in six weeks due to such violence. The displacement of Palestinians who are either forced to flee or have had their homes invaded in the occupied West Bank. From January 2022 to September 2023, a little bit over 1,100 Palestinians were forcibly transferred. From October 7, so this is one month, we are almost with 900 Palestinians forcibly transferred. Israeli settlers themselves have long felt entitled to take Palestinian homes. During the Sheikh Jarrah evictions in 2020, one settler openly admitted to a land grab. You are stealing my house. And if I don't steal it, someone else is going to steal it. No, no one, no one uh, uh, is allowed to steal it, Yammi. But the land is not Israel's. Its administration falls under the Palestinian Authority, which is under Israeli occupation. And that is a violation of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2334, which states the country's occupation has no legal legitimacy. Now, settlements in the occupied territories had been called the biggest obstacle to peace between Israel and Palestine. They've always been illegal, yet in the West Bank, and not including East Jerusalem, the number of settlers has increased from just 4,400 in 1977 to more than half a million today. Now, most of the world has looked the other way while their numbers continue to grow, but as attention is firmly focused elsewhere, settlers seem to feel more empowered to use violence to take land and displace more Palestinians. Joining me now to talk more about what's happening in the West Bank and where that leaves its future, are from Occupied East Jerusalem. Adam Bulukos, he is the director of UNRWA Affairs in the West Bank. From Ramallah, Mustafa Barghouti is the secretary general of the Palestinian National Initiative and a member of the Palestinian Legislative Council. And from West Jerusalem, Jeff Halper is the director of the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions. Thanks all so much for being with me. You know, Jeff, I gave some numbers just there on how much the settler population has grown, but from your perspective, how bad has their expansion really been on the ground and how much worse is it getting while our attention is diverted? Well, I mean, there's two issues. Uh, first of all, the number of settlers, of course. As you said, it's almost a half a million in the West Bank, but you have to add in East Jerusalem, which is a part of the occupied territory, 
in which case we get to about 750,000 settlers in the West Bank. And Betsalo Smotrich, who's the head of the civil administration and a minister uh, in the um, uh, you know, in the Ministry of Defense has said it'll rise to more than a million within a couple of years. So that's one aspect. The other is, of course, it's not just settlements, but the settlements are strategically located in order to control Palestinian land. Mm -hmm. We have to talk about settlement blocks <clears throat> and not merely settlements, you know, that are located anywhere. And the settlement blocks go up and down the Jordan Valley up and down the western part of uh, the West Bank, and with two uh, branches from uh, the east to the west, one through the city of Ariel and the other through the greater Jerusalem area. And that creates a grid within which the Palestinians are locked into little fragmented uh, areas. And so we have to look at settlements not only in terms of how many settlers yeah. or how many settlements, but in terms of this settlement block issue and the issue of control. It's, it, you know, as you're giving the numbers of settlers, yes, that's why I said this doesn't include our graft, did not include uh, occupied East Jerusalem. But we have to remember that those 700,000 settlers between West Bank and, and East Jerusalem exist in a population of less than 3 million in the West Bank. I mean, that is a huge proportion. So, Jeff, just quickly, I mean, how much land do you think Palestinians will actually be left with should the Gaza conflict end? Uh, I'll show you exactly. And this is really uh, important because Biden has already announced that after the fighting in Gaza dies down, there's going to be uh, a, a, a European-American initiative to impose a two-state solution not a peace process, not negotiations, an imposition of what we consider an apartheid regime. And this is exactly what the map will look like. The Palestinians will be, will be um, confined to, uh, to basically uh, here one, two, three uh, little enclaves in the West Bank, plus, of course, Gaza. Yeah. And this is a map of apartheid, where Israel ends up with 85% of the land, and the Palestinians with a truncated 15% that's left. I mean, uh, let me ask Adam, if, mm -hmm. you know, at the UN, you are, you agree with these numbers. And why is it that it has not, it's such a simplistic question, I know, but why is it that it has not been stopped? The reality is that there is no part of the West Bank which is not touched and controlled by Israel. Mm. Um, so even though it looks on a map to be relatively contiguous or there's a big chunk of territory, which is, you know, the, the West Bank under Palestinian control, there's none of it that's under Palestinian control in real terms. The occupation means that every, every life, every daily transaction of every individual in the West Bank is impacted. So our movements on a map that looks quite small, you know, uh, if you, as the crow flies between location A and B, you think, oh, this ought to be 20 minutes, 30 minutes. It can take hours. I have staff members that have, you know, several hours of uh, commute every day in this very, very small patch of land because of the way everything is parceled out, segmented. And now since the war, there's nearly, you know, a complete uh, imposition of a lockdown in the West Bank, which makes movements uh, between cities uh, and even within governors uh, uh, nearly impossible for Palestinians. Adam, let me ask you, though, quickly, if you can answer this. What do you feel like people do not know about what is really happening in the West Bank right now when it comes to, to settler activity? Sure. I mean, the settler violence is one piece of the puzzle, and it's expanded uh, enormously in the last uh, month, in the time of the war, a bit more than a month. Uh, over 1,000 people have been uh, driven from their homes. These tend to be the poorest of the poor. These are Bedouin communities. Um, uh, that, are, that are simply harassed so regularly that they can't remain in their homes. Now, that's one piece of the violence puzzle. But the more significant violence, of course, is from the Israeli military presence. And last year, 2022, the, the worst year on record, as far as the UN was recording, we had something like 154 deaths. Now we're at nearly 500 um, in, this, in this year. And last year, as I said, was the worst ever. So we thought, what can get worse?
10,000 military incursions, significant military incursions in the last, in the last weeks uh, that destroy infrastructure, uh, that knock down buildings, that rip up water systems, electricity systems. Uh, so the, the thing which, which I, I found most um, uh, interesting when I took the job uh, a, a bit over a year ago, having worked in difficult places, I was in Sudan, I was in Afghanistan, I was in Pakistan, places that the UN would designate as, you know, conflict zones or, you know, challenging duty stations, however you want to phrase it. And what struck me here is the near constant military engagement. You know, we have refugee camps and other communities that are hard hit on a nearly daily basis. And that, I think, is what uh, people need to understand about the West Bank. That is what a military occupation looks like. Okay. Mustafa, I mean, I know you are already familiar with everything you've just heard from our other two panelists. So if you can tell us from your perspective in Ramallah, what daily life is like now in the West Bank? I mean, what kind of so-called laws are now being imposed to stop Palestinians from just leading normal, even average lives? Well, uh, before talking about that, we have to remember that uh, with what's happening now in West Bank, <clears throat> the enhancement of settlers and the settler colonial system, uh, bringing up the number of settlers from to 121,000, when also agreement was signed to more than 750,000 today, is only a reflection of the fact that many Western leaders are shying away from, which is that Israel itself is nothing but a settler colonial project. It was initiated as a settler colonial project. And in 1948, when the state of Israel was announced, during the war that broke out, Israel uh, eliminated uh, 520 Palestinian communities, towns and villages, they erased them to the ground, and they committed more than 52 massacres, forcing no less than 70 percent of the Palestinian people out of the land on which Israel was created. And uh, now they continue the same approach, in a different way, but the same approach. Uh, the ethnic cleansing and the collective punishment and the genocide that the Israeli army is engaging in now in Gaza Strip is even worse than what happened in 1948. And in the case of the West Bank, which was occupied by Israel, like Gaza Strip and East Jerusalem back in 1967, uh, for some people, it was an occupation that would be transitional. But for most Israelis, it became a permanent situation. Mm. And uh, these settlers who were settled uh, legally in the West Bank became themselves a huge political power in Israel. And their goal is very clearly declared. The goal of this Israeli government is to ethnically cleanse all Palestinians, not okay. only from Gaza, also from the West Bank. And our life is nothing but uh, a life of subjugation to the most terrible racist apartheid system depriving people from all their rights, depriving people from the okay. very simple ability to have a normal life. Let me ask uh, Jeff, I'll come back to you, because the settlers, one could easily say, are, are kind of very close to Netanyahu's heart. So is what is happening particularly right now, you know, a part of a plan on behalf of Netanyahu, and Israel's right wing, right wing in particular, to eventually just annex most of the West Bank and Gaza for that matter. I mean, you showed the map. What would be left of Palestinian territory is so, you know, mm -hmm. negligible that it just looks like this does fit into Netanyahu's most extreme uh, vision for his country, is to basically take it over and occupy mm -hmm. the entire land. Annex and occupy. <laughs> well... Well, just to pick up on Mustafa's point, uh, we have to remember, I mean, this didn't begin on October 7th, as Israel's right. trying to present it, and Israel is simply responding. This is a 130-year campaign, a project, of taking over Palestine. That was the idea of Zionism. And we can't pin this all on Netanyahu. <laughs> Don't forget, the Zionist movement really was a labor Zionist, a socialist even movement. All those years, in 1948, as Mustafa said, when 750,000 Palestinians were 
thrown out of the country. That was done by the Labour Party. That was Ben Gurion. 1967 was the Labour Party. The starting of settlements, settlements was the Labour Party. You know, uh, Netanyahu wants to nail it down because for the time being, he's the prime minister. I don't think he'll be the prime minister when this actually comes to fruition. But this was the idea of Zionism, was to transform an Arab country into a Jewish country, to Judaize Palestine. And we're in the mopping up phase. Mm. I think that's what's important to emphasize, that, uh, that we're finishing up. And that's where I think all the eyes should be, even though we're focused on Gaza, which is the most dramatic, all the eyes should be on the West Bank and on Biden's initiative. This is because that is going to be the final international approval of this 130-year campaign to make Palestine a Jewish state. And that's basically what we have. And the only way that can be done, of course, is through an apartheid system. Because Israel can't drive out the 7 million Palestinians living in the country, and so it has to have an apartheid system. Mm. And this, I think, again, is a general Zionist Israeli project. The Labour Party merits the Zionist left. The entire spectrum of Israeli politics is involved in this. This isn't only Likud and the okay. religious Zionists and ben Gvir and the extremists. This is a Okay. A, a consensus project of the Israeli population. Fair enough. But, I mean, Jeff, you, you mentioned Biden's, you know, what Bi the, the United States has, has said. And we heard Biden talk about the, the end game of this imposing a two-state solution. I mean, what is that then? Oh, is that realistic at all? Because what will there be left to form a state with? And how would, especially with the people in power now, how would they ever accept with arguably the massive amounts of radicalization they may have created with their war in Gaza and what they're doing in the West Bank with the settlers. How would Israelis ever trust having a, an independent Palestinian state on their border uh, with what's happened now? I mean, what is this talk about a two-state solution at this point, is my question. Jeff, go ahead quickly. Well, well it isn't really a two-state solution. Again, it's, a, it's an apartheid situation. So we don't have a Palestinian state that can actually endanger Israel in any way. It will never have an army. Maybe it'll have a little police force in order to do Israel's security business, like it does today in the Palestinian Authority. Um, but it, it'll simply be you know, a little, little bantu stand within a very powerful Israel that controls everything. And I think the idea is, and here we get back to the idea of normalization. Israel's idea, and Netanyahu says this very openly, is that the international community already accepts uh, the settlements. There is no international will to, to dismantle the settlements. Mali al Domim is, uh, is uh, 50,000 people. You're going to dismantle that and send the people back? That's not going to happen. The international community has accepted the settlements already. It's accepted this greater Israel idea, the apartheid idea. And now, now the Arab states are falling into place. Uh, and uh, that's the normalization project. So I think what Gaza did was it disrupted this whole, and that might explain the timing of the attack of Hamas to some degree. It was right on the cusp of Saudi Arabia joining this normalization process that would have erased the Palestinians completely from the political process. Mm. And that's where I think the international community, that's, I think, their idea, to mar and Israel to marginalize the Palestinians to a point where there's simply not a political force, nobody cares, and, and we'll get on with normalization, and the Palestinians will have to simply reconcile w with whatever crumbs they get. Okay. Um, Adam, I'm going to come back to you. Yeah. Change tack slightly. I know you don't want to comment too much on you know, potential political outcomes here. Uh, but let me ask you from on the ground... When we look at Gaza, the damage just looks completely irreversible at this point. But can what has happened in the West Bank with the settler violence and with the takeover of so many Palestinian homes unlawfully, can that damage, do you think, be undone? Hmm. 
Well, first on Gaza, you know, let me kind of tip my hat to the to the colleagues who were there. My counterpart, Tom White, who's the, the director. We have 13,000 staff in Gaza. We've lost over 100 staff, which is, you know, a record for the UN. So the situation in Gaza is tragic. It looks almost earthquake-like in, the, in, the, in terms of the devastation. So what Gaza looks like after all of this will be a massive, massive humanitarian challenge. In the in in the West Bank, you know, I think I agree with with Jeff on this. Is that just the practicalities of a of a two state solution, and the dismantling of settlements is so impractical? Um, you know, exactly where do people go? And and we have this kind of perfect political storm now. Let's say of. Uh, the the right wing leaning government where things are just exaggerated and there's a bit of a catalyst, you know, that Gaza was a catalyst for this or the actions of Hamas on the 7th of October were a catalyst for actions that were already uh, well ingrained and they're just kind of being ramped up. Um, what we're seeing certainly in, uh, uh, in some of the towns and some of the refugee camps is some significant physical infrastructure damage that can be repaired. But the fear is, and we're already having these conversations with the Palestinian Authority, is that as soon as we fix something, it's destroyed again. In Nur Sham's camp, my, my own sanitation laborers have repaired the same manhole cover six times in the last three months. You know, so this kind of constant cycle of violence, you know, it really uh, eats at people. There's massive mental health, psychosocial needs that are that just are pervasive in the West Bank. And what I, you know, come out of all of my missions from, and I'm in the West Bank, you know, uh, very frequently, several times a week, is the despair. I think because people don't see a light at the end of the tunnel, a, a political process is, is it used to be kind of, you know, dormant. Now it, it seems to be largely dead after the, uh, the 7 October uh, events. Uh, so what does the West Bank really look like? And it will be some kind of, uh, you know, parcel together, uh, quasi state that's you know a, adjacent to or fully surrounded by another significant you know state that has a big military and won't allow that um, any military significant military presence in Palestine because they don't want October seventh to happen again. Mm. You know, so I think a lot of the physical stuff, a lot of those repairs are very doable. But the longer term, how does, for example, right now, and sorry uh, to take another second. We have something like 200,000 West Bankers who are not allowed to work in Israel now. There's a complete shutdown. That means about half of the economy is now dead in the West Bank. As well. And that's a huge issue. This is something we have to keep an eye on because we, we may create a, a state that was you know reasonably stable in terms of food security, commodities access. But now if nobody's working and there's no money, how does also the PA continue with services and education, healthcare, right. and those things? All of this may may become very even more fragile than it is now. Uh, you know, Mustafa. I mean, to conclude, stopping illegal settlers was really actually just the easiest ask. No one is on their side. No country recognizes their right to build settlements, except for this tiny minority uh, of Israelis that are constantly protected. I guess, Mustafa, did you ever think Israeli settlements and this illegal activity could get this far? And how much worse do you expect it to get as far as these settlers are concerned? We exactly expected that. And that's why we opposed Oslo agreement, because it allowed, uh, it was a peace agreement, so-called peace agreement, that allowed Israelis to continue to build settlements. Mm -hmm. And we warned them that this will lead to a disaster. And that's exactly what we have. I don't think Israelis would accept any Palestinian state. And I don't think Mr. Biden is serious about it. He speaks about ultimately there will be something. We've seen the maps of the Palestinian state that uh, before uh, before Biden, his predecessor, uh, proposed. Uh, it's all about panto stands under the Israeli control. Netanyahu declared it several times, and his government declared it, and all the other people who might become prime ministers like uh, Gantz and uh, uh, all of them uh, have said that, Labid as well, that they will not allow a Palestinian independent state. And Netanyahu rose a map in the United Nations two weeks before the war broke out in Gaza, where he showed the map of Israel. The map of Israel, including the total annexation of the Golan Heights, the total annexation of West Bank, and the total annexation of Gaza Strip. Okay. These people don't want a solution. And I tell you, 
any country in the world, whether in the West, European West, or the United States, or anybody else who speaks about two-state solution is insincere mm. if they don't combine that goal with demanding the immediate and complete and total eviction of all settlers from the West Bank. Okay. Mustafa. It sounds impossible. It sounds impossible. But then the two states will be impossible. And if the two-state solution is not there, what is the solution? Mustafa. We will not leave the country and we will not accept ethnic cleansing. Yeah. They don't want two states. Let us have one democratic state. Mustafa, that will have to be the final word. Uh, I'd like to thank all three of my panelists sincerely so much for being with us. Jeff, I know you had something to add. Unfortunately, we're completely out of time. So thank you again. And our viewers, of course, for joining us as well. Remember, you can follow us on X and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time. Thank you.